Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much for joining. Um, my name is Adonis Trubukis. I am a postdoctoral researcher in NCS at Democtos, and I'm uh, currently leading the open calls of the AI for Copernicus project. Now, the purpose of this meeting is uh, to present to you all the, all the applicants of the, fair, of the fifth open call, the AI for Copernicus services. And we, we, thought, uh, we thought that this would, be, this would be a nice idea because uh, um, the fifth open call is actually about testing uh, AI for Copernicus services. So we hope that this, uh, these presentations we help you write your own proposal. So, but before going to the details of the fifth open call, I would like to say uh, some things about uh, AI for Copernicus. Uh, now, AI for Copernicus aims to bridge uh, this, the two, these two worlds that, 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 that are seen here in this figure. On the other hand, we have the European uh, AI on demand platform, which is, uh, aims to be the one stop shops for the AI data set, the AI methods, and in general, the AI community in Europe. And on the other hand, we have the Earth Observation World. Uh, Earth Observation uh, data and services have reached a significant level of maturity in the DIAS uh, platforms and produced, uh, produced uh, value in various domains such as energy, agriculture, security, um, secu security and health, and so on. So, Earth Copernicus is in the middle, aims, aiming to bridge these two worlds in order to make the on-demand platform the platform of choice for users of Copernicus data along the value chain. And um, now we do this in the Afro Copernicus using, uh, with, with two ways. First of all, with a series of open calls. Uh, and second, with a series of, uh, of services that we offer to the community to help them uh, uh, build their solutions. Now, the Afro Copernicus Consortium has uh, 11 partners for seven uh, countries. Uh, uh, we have uh, several uh, areas of expertise. We have uh, research, um, uh, partners from research and academic community that have uh, technical expertise or business expertise. And also we have partners in the industrial community that are uh, either AI experts or ethnographic experts. So we think we would do that. And uh, now, um, uh, as I said earlier, we, the partners say they are for Copernicus build, build a series of services and tools to help uh, to help the ecosystem to, to grow in uh, in the areas of Earth observation and AI. Uh, the services are in security, agriculture, energy, health, or general services. The people here will present in detail, but I have uh, put here the the, the services. Um, also, I would like to talk uh, briefly about the four open calls that we have already reached. These open calls have been completed and the projects are already running. Uh, most of them, uh, some of them have ended, some of them are in the last months, and we have uh, also some projects that, that are around the, in, the mid, in the middle. Um, we have several, um, in several domains and in, in the consortiums and, uh, of SMEs or SMEs and so on. Now we had um, uh, some budget left uh, during the open call procedure, so we decided to, to organize an extra open call, um, which is a little bit different than the, the, other, the others that we have, we have offered. Now this type of proposal proposals about uh, micro projects for testing AI for Copernicus services. Um, with the, these are micro projects, meaning that uh, they are uh, five months. Uh, so, uh, but the difference from, from the other uh, two open calls that we we actually because it is the, the short period of, of five months we, we did not expect from from the from uh, the projects to create new AI solutions or a, a, to cre create a new AI services and so on. We are we are in, we are interested in testing uh, the AI for Copernicus services that, that were already built. For example, you can use uh, uh, the, you, you can you can utilize the use cases and the, the, the in the domain of your, of your company or the, the data the data and scenarios that you have to to build the test case scenarios that uh, may utilize uh, um, and test AI for Copernicus services. 
uh, we are interested in any industrial domain, uh, energy, security, health, agriculture, and other sectors like maritime aviation and so on. So we have, uh, unlike the previous open calls, we don't have uh, uh, any issue with that. And the beneficiaries are technology advanced companies. We have we allow uh, consortium with our one company, so we have single beneficiary projects. The funding will be 30k for each project, and we will fund 10 uh, 10 proposals. Um, the deadlines are. Uh, as we have say, we say in the site, uh, the open call has has started in February, and we landed in the 31st, 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 excuse me, 31st of March. And uh, we will select the projects during April, and the projects we the winning projects will be from June to to October 2023. Uh, what we will offer, we will offer Afro Copernicus resources and tools. We will offer technical mentoring. And we will offer cloud resources uh, in Claudia so or Wikio in, in the cloud Pero um, uh, infrastructure. And um, uh, one thing that what I have said the links here that, that are, are available, we have shared them already to you, and we will share them again. Uh, but one thing I would like to tell you is that uh, I want to, to mention that the utilization of Earth for, for Copernicus services, because the, the, the because the, the proposal is, is about testing AI for Copernicus services. The utilization of AI Copernicus services, at least one uh, of uh, any, any that, that you think that uh, fits in your company is mandatory. And we also offer some, uh, we encourage the uh, usage of other AI for Copernicus services that will, will be presented uh, also in the, in the webinar, like AI Energy Services and the AI, and the AI for Experience Platform. This is optional, but highly, highly encouraged. Um, so the, uh, the agenda of the meeting is the following. Uh, we will start with an overview of the bootstrapping services, which is the services in the security, agriculture, health, and energy domain. And we, then we will have a presentation of uh, the cloud resources that we offer. Um, then we have an overview of uh, other common semantic services like linked data tools and uh, 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 query answers engine. And, the, by, and then we have two, two other sessions that are not, are not uh, the, these services are, are not services offered uh, by the AI for Copernicus uh, partners, but uh, the, we think that it, we, it could be useful for you. And we have the IFR for experiments platform and uh, an overview of supplementary services by the, the AI Energy Project. You have, we will have a Q&A session in the end. Uh, but um, what, what we wanted to say is that um, we please uh, write your questions in the chat. Um, we will try to answer them now, uh, either by chat or uh, in the final QA session. If we don't, uh, if we didn't manage, in any case, we will uh, uh, update the uh, frequently asked questions document that we have with any any questions that we have uh, already had uh, you with uh, uh, by, by email or in the chat here, and we, we will uh, of course answer these questions with these questions for you. So uh, with that. Uh, I would like to continue uh, first with the overview of the bootstrapping services. With these services will be presented by Satsen, UnityN, Thales, CMWF, and Equinor, which are partners of the AI for Copernicus Consortium. And uh, the floor is uh, the, the people that will present this weekend are Zarino, Marbalero, Julio Workman, David Hassan, Harder, as you have been, uh, Richard Hall. And uh, Michele, the floor is yours to present the, the Alpha Open process. Thank you very much again for all of you for joining and let's continue to the next session. Uh, thank you, uh, Antonis, for the introduction. Uh, I will give you just a very brief uh, presentation of uh, what the bootstrapping services are. I'm Michele Zarini, I'm a project manager of the European Union Satellite Center. And uh, uh, Satellite is actually leading the work package for the development and implementation of these bootstrapping services. So these services basically were initially identified in the proposal phase and uh, developed considering four domains, security, agriculture, energy, and health. So the idea is to 
make some uh, uh, model bootstrapping services, it would be more correct to speak about resources because we have services and also data set available uh, for the open core. So the idea is to identify and develop uh, services who can be, uh, which that can support the development of uh, uh, application based on artificial intelligence through open calls. So the idea is to develop these services to support the open calls, uh, trying to uh, develop uh, something uh, to to remove a burden to uh, to develop these services, let's say before the uh, development of AI tools. For instance, you will see now how we develop uh, service related to the preprocessing of data of the uh, labeling of data set of training algorithms so the idea is from inside i for copernicus project provide support to the open course winner through these uh, different services the services are uh, if i'm not mistaken uh, uh, 15 services plus the access to one data set uh, which is facilitated by uh, i for um, for copernicus partners uh, you can see here the domain and uh, uh, meaning that these services have been created and developed think about a specific domain. But because these open calls are also general for other type of uh, other type of domains, maritime aviation, also uh, you can use for instance a security service for agriculture, it depends of uh, your need. These services can be let's say used by um, uh, in different domains. Uh, what is uh, will be um, different uh, if you are awarded for the for the for the project is uh, the interface that you have within the project but mainly for the moment is the just complicating um, thing so you just can think about all the services are available for you and uh, as um, Antonio said at the beginning this uh, your project will be um, uh, based on the application based also or based on these services on bootstrapping services uh, you can see, for instance, uh, the one in security, which are mainly pre-processing pre pre pro processing of um, uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images. There are services from agriculture about a uh, deep network for uh, piece classification or uh, harmonization data set, uh, agriculture, uh, and also for uh, pre-trained long short-term memory, uh, other type of neural network classification. Uh, energy data set and one tool from uh, the air from CWF about the downscale of CAMS air quality model data. All these data, all these uh, services are uh, uh, described in a very detailed way in the um, technical documentation, which I guess you have to, to read very carefully for the when you prepare your, uh, your proposal. Uh, just a bit of chronology of these services, as I said before, were identified in the proposal phase and were then refined according to some uh, user needs. And the first service were developed in, uh, at the end of the first year of the project, so December 2021. These services will, uh, were also refined according to the feedback provided by the first batch of open calls uh, winner. And a second version of some of these services were uh, um, was deployed in August 2022. Services are now maintained for the open calls and open calls that have been already awarded, so meaning number one, two, three, and four, and uh, will be also maintained, of course, during uh, your uh, your projects. It can be also fine-tuned according to your need if the amount of uh, um, uh, work to, to refine them is not like uh, completely changing the um, approach of these uh, services but some fine tuning can be can be done uh, i will ask the resources this is going to be uh, way clearer in the next presentation when uh, with us uh, with some demo uh, i can just anticipate you that all the resources have been packaged in a uh, docker as application and uh, uh, as you will see we also have in the roadmap for the last part of the project the integration in the i4 experiments platform uh, with a docker registry managed by Cloud Ferro, and uh, uh, you will access to this Docker registry if you are awarded with a classic username and password. And uh, regarding the fine tuning of, a, of the services, uh, as I said before, we already mm, uh, evolved the service from the first version, but can be also uh, uh, further uh, fine tuned in, the, in this phase. Moreover, if you are like, uh, if you want to play with the, the, the service itself, the source code is available in the Docker images. So you can actually 
customize the service on your own. With responsible visual bootstrapping services, uh, resources, uh, maybe as I said before, from outside for you is not very relevant uh, at the moment, but it's important to, to say that if you are awarded, there is gonna be a specific uh, technical support provided to you to, or, uh, to how to use, um, execute the, the service, how to understand better maybe the technical documentation. Uh, so in case uh, you're, um, you want to also know uh, in this phase uh, more information about uh, some uh, technical details, you can either uh, contact directly the IE for Copernicus team and uh, drop an email to this uh, address. And again, as I said, uh, the, this, uh, during your, uh, your project, you will have uh, full support from, uh, from us in the, for the development of your, uh, of your uh, services. Now, I think for me is, uh, is enough. I will pass the floor to the different, uh, uh, let's say, service providers. And we start with my colleague Omar Barillero from Satsen. We're gonna, he's gonna give you an introduction of the um, security services. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm going to present the security services. First of all, I'm Omar Barguer. I'm working with, with Michele in the European Union Satellite Center. Uh, we have been developing these security services for the AA for Copernicus. And I am the guy more technical in this way. So if you have any doubt about the security services now or during the project, I will be supporting to you. So first of all, I would like to, to list the, the services that we have created. We have more focus on the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. And in fact, our services, uh, we have classified them as in the domain of the security because of the background of our, uh, of the Satsen, of the center we are working on, but there are generic algorithms. So basically we can classify them as pre-processing algorithms for Sentinel-1 and for Sentinel-2. Then we have a couple of services that are more related to the change detection, also from Sentinel-1 and from Sentinel-2. And we are also offering a data set with vector data based on the OpenStreetMap in a different way, also based in, the, in a, a dictionary that is more relevant for security. So even you see that there are uh, classified as security, these are general services. So my idea is to present uh, the different services during the presentation today and try to solve if you have any question. So first of all, as I said, we are focusing on the, on the pre-processing of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, and all the services are using mainly uh, two main tools that are SNAP. I suppose if you have worked with Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2 already, you know it. It's the common software that it is uh, uh, built by, by ISA and support also the, supported by the Sentinel-2 boxes that are also inside the SNAP. And SNAP has a, a capability that is the graph processing tool that allow us also to run it, uh, not just with the graphical user interface, that it is the common way of using SNAP, but it is also possible to run the workflows in batch mode. And in fact, most of our services are based on these uh, graphs that we are generating with SNAP and we are running it using the the services in the in the Docker images. So if you are familiarized with this, you will see later some of the description of the services that we are using this capability. And also we are using in part uh, the interface Snappy that it is offering Snap in order to access to the uh, to the Java directly uh, source code of library of, of Snap from Python because our services are based on, in Python. And also we are using Gital that it is I think the, the most common geospatial data library for, for working with raster images. So first of all is the for the Sentinel one. The thing is that uh, when working mainly with artificial intelligence algorithms and so on, it is not easy to ingest directly the Sentinel one or Sentinel two data. So we have to make some pre-processing. In general, this pre-processing basically we can reduce like as uh, radiometric corrections, geometric correction, and it is basically what we are doing with Sentinel one and Sentinel two. For Sentinel one, we have two different pre-processing chains that are for 
uh, the two um, formats that are uh, used to, to work with Sentinel-1, that it is the GRD products and the SLC. So for the GR product, it is a, a product that we don't have information about the phase of the, of the radar. We have just information about the amplitude and it is uh, more similar to, more simple to work with if you are not interested in this uh, phase capabilities of the SR. And basically for the processing, we are running this graph in a snap. So we are using different models in a snap. So I, I said before, if you have worked with the GPT, you will recognize most of these modules, but we are making this pre-processing. And then we are also applying some, uh, some commands with digital in order to convert the data format to the desired uh, data format that you need for, for as input for other for the processing. And in particular also, all these parameters as the one we are allowing to uh, change for the processing. Perhaps you can select a different spectral filter or you want you, be, you are able to select which is the polarization you are interested on or which is the output resolution you are interested or the area of interest in order to subset the product. But uh, all of these parameters has a, a default selection. So basically uh, you can run is just directly with the Sentinel one GRD preprocess, this input, and I want the output here. So you, then you can optimize if you want for the different specific uh, speckle filter or polarization or, or whatever. And in the same way, we are preprocessing the SLC products. And if you are also used to work with this kind of product, you know that it is more complex. And usually these products are used when you need to compute uh, things like the coherence or you want to make interference with Sentinel-1. So in principle, you can think that this pre-processing in order to obtain this terrain corrected calibrated backscatter, it's something that this it could be thing that you, it could be thing that it could be stupid because we have already the GRD with this uh, that is a problem more similar to this and we don't need this more complex processing. But the thing is that uh, wait, let's see the, the, we have the graph again here and the parameters. But the thing is that we have noticed in some of our internal product uh, projects that this uh, uh, generic processing that it is made by ISA in order to convert the SLC to GRD, that it is something that we can more or less uh, simulate with, with the SNAP and the graph is something similar to this. It's sometimes producing the smoothing on some pixels that could be of interest. So for example, for very specific applications, like for example, in this case was the monitoring of oil tanks and we tried to make a study in order to be able to see the different levels of the roof tank in order to estimate the, the oil stocks in a center, for example, if we go directly with the GRD, we see nothing and we cannot see anything, but with this ad hoc SLC processing allow us to differentiate a little this uh, behavior and different response to the radar imagery. And we are able to estimate this. So it's for that that we prepared this uh, pre-processing in order to try to exploit more the capabilities that sometimes is missed when we apply the multi-looking and some speckle filter and so on. So this could be for more specific applications related to understanding the real value of specific pictures as you want to avoid some smoothing in the, in the image. Uh, for Sentinel-2, it is again the same. We are applying the processing and you can select uh, which are the bands you are interested on and so on. And in particular, also for the Sentinel-2 preprocessing, we are allowing also the support of applying Lancy mask or cloud mask. So the Lancy mask is something that we obtain directly from a digital elevation model. And the cloud mask, also we have the different options and you can select if we can use the cloud mask that it is present in the level 1C of Sentinel-2 or in the level 2A. So, uh, or even apply an algorithm based in the band information. So basically uh, you cannot see directly the cloud mask here in the graph because the cloud mask in some way uh, uh, working here in the band mat, the generic band mat that we have optimized to work as a cloud mask for, for this. But basically the processing should be the same. If we are applying uh, this mask and making the subset reprojected to have a common resolution. And we are, with this way, we are obtaining this uh, reflectance already resembled for all the bands of interest that could be the input directly to for, a, for example, a deep learning process for, for training. So these are the three main uh, processes that we have for the pre-processing. And then we have a couple of, of processes that are more focused on the chain detection, as I said. For the Sentinel-1, uh, we have a generic uh, uh, 
uh, workflow that it is based in the input of SLC images, a single loop complex images, and it is computing as output the coherence, the ACD or the amplitude chain detection, that it is an example is this, for example, and also the multi-temporal coherence that it is similar to the amplitude coherence, but also represent the in advance the coherence and allow us to see different changes. It is true that uh, depending on if you are only in the type of changes, perhaps the ACD, the, the type of changes you are, are of interest for you, the ACD or the MTC could be more relevant. And it's true that if you are only working with the ACD, you could use directly as input the Sentinel-1 GRD, but in order to not complicate too much the processing with the uh, inputs from GRD or SLC and so on, we have tried to homogenize as a common input, that is, that is the SLC. But if needed, we can we could separate this process in order to use the to compute the ACD only with the Sentinel-1 GRT as input and not uh, using the SLC. But we have uh, um, tried to homogenize it like this. And examples of the results are like this. This is the an ACD and the MTC in the same area in, in a port. And in particular, we see with the ACD that it is an RGB composite. We see in the different colors the changes. It, it, they are very uh, quick of uh, see changes that are the, the ships that we see the ships in one date in red and the in other date in blue but also in the city or in the port we could see some changes for example we see something blue here or something red here that could represent some changes and what we can see also with the MTC is that we see the changes with a different uh, colors, but we are also able to see other changes that, for example, these areas are the containers areas of the of the port that we don't see changes in the amplitude because we have always containers and we have always high amplitude. So for the if we analyze only the amplitude, we see that okay, this is an area where we have high amplitude in the back spatter, cutter always, so no change. But with the multi-temporal coherence, when considering the coherence we see that, okay, we have high altitude, but something has changed. Something has changed in the coherence and the phase return from the backscatter is different. So we see also some changes. So depending on the kind of activity you are monitoring, the ACD or the MTC could be more relevant. Uh, okay, so this was the change for Sentinel-1 and for Sentinel-2 chain detection, uh, we use an algorithm that it is based in the uh, change vector or analysis. So basically, we are pre-processing a pair of Sentinel-1 images, and then we are computing a vector of differences with the, the band selected as input. And with this, we built a, a vector and based on the amplitude of this vector, we are computing uh, this uh, this, we are classifying all the pixels as changes or not, depending of, of the amplitude of, of, of this uh, vector. And also the direction of this vector allow us to classify the change in different subtypes of, of classes. So basically you will see that the inputs are the Sentinel-2 images, the resolution that we want, the ones we want to consider, and we have the number of classes, that it is the, the number of classes that we are going to use to separate the different directions of the results and the level of confidence that allow us to set uh, from a statistical point of view the threshold in order to classify a pixel as change or not change. And this was for the Sentinel-2 chain detection. And then we had also this uh, vector data of human features that it is like a different way to work with OpenStreetMap. So we know that when trying to work with OpenStreetMap, it's not always easy because there are some limitations in the service and APIs. The data structure is not the, the most preferred by the security domain. So uh, we had internally a uh, different data dictionary and Satsin is processing some of uh, some areas in this, uh, some vector of OpenStreetMap in these areas in order to transform to this uh, uh, such a data dictionary, and this is on th something also that we can offer if you are interested in specific areas for, for your project. And yes, this was my last slide. I don't know if you have any question, please uh, write in the chat. I will try to, to reply to you during the, during the presentation, and if not, offline later in the, in the web page. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Vaikman Julio from the University of Trento, and uh, today I'll enter into the details of the of the service for the uh, agriculture domain. Uh, most of the services that uh, I'm going to show you are um, 
for the agricultural domain, but can be easily adapted across different domain and uh, can be used uh, on uh, different uh, application and uh, use cases. Uh, the presentation uh, will be uh, shared with David Hassan from uh, Thales that will enter into the details of the services and the resources that have been developed and shared by Thales. So, as I said, uh, we have uh, different services uh, with different purposes. We have uh, resources such as a very large uh, training uh, database. We have uh, pre-processing uh, techniques uh, um, for harmonizing uh, time series, different time series of uh, uh, Sentinel-2 data. We have uh, different uh, uh, automatic classifiers that are based on uh, deep learning uh, uh, techniques. And uh, they can be used uh, with uh, the agricultural domain or can be adapted to any uh, different uh, domains. Uh, today, I'll briefly explain the different components uh, without entering into the details. Uh, we have all the documentation available online. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask them. I'll try to uh, answer them uh, uh, as best as possible. So. The first resource that I'm going to present you is uh, a very large uh, database uh, called uh, Time Sent to Crop. Uh, this uh, data set is based on uh, time series of uh, Sentinel 2 images uh, and focuses uh, on uh, uh, agricultural classes. So, here you can see on the right the uh, legend of uh, uh, the database consisting uh, to, uh, in uh, 15 different uh, uh, crop type classes. And the data set has been uh, developed and uh, built uh, in the Ostian country. And uh, you can see um, the uh, different statistics for each uh, crop type samples contained in uh, the data set on the slide. Uh, we acquired the samples uh, during an agronomic year. So we have uh, one year of uh, acquisitions stored in the database. and. Uh, uh, spanning uh, several uh, um, Sentinel-2 tiles. Uh, we have also on the slide the reference, uh, if you are curious and if you want more detail about the, uh, the data set, you can check that or you can ask us uh, directly. Um, we have uh, um, a pre-processing uh, step uh, service, which is the Sentinel-2 tile harmonizations, uh, which consists in the harmonization of uh, 10 series um, that have different length that might be due to the cloud presence or the um, cloud hampering uh, happening in the Sentinel-2 images, or you can have different uh, 10 series across different areas due to overlapping uh, orbits, so you have more images for some tile and uh, a lower number of images for other. And uh, using this uh, kind of uh, pre-processing, uh, you can uh, both deal with the presence uh, of the clouds obtaining more clean results, uh, and you can harmonize uh, the um, the length of the time series uh, in order to train uh, efficiently a, a classifier based on a fixed um, time step and uh, time series. This service uh, has been built uh, and can be used uh, together with uh, the service that you saw uh, in the previous presentation of uh, Satsen. So, um, you can uh, take the output uh, of uh, that pre-processing and uh, harmonize uh, the different images uh, retrieved. We are also uh, giving uh, um, classifiers, uh, automatic classifiers by, based on uh, neural network. So for example, uh, we are uh, giving a pre-trained LSTM that was trained on the time center crop database that I showed you before. Um, so uh, the network takes uh, as input the harmonized time series. So it takes as input 12 monthly composites for each agronomic year and produces a crop type map. This can be uh, used only for the inference on uh, uh, new uh, images and new areas, but uh, you have to keep in mind that the architecture was trained in Austria, so you have to uh, use it uh, uh, considering area that uh, show a, a similar um, spectral trend to the area in which we trained. Otherwise, you can easily uh, take the network and uh, fine tune it over the area of interest that you are analyzing in order to optimize the uh, architecture 
architecture and perform the uh, crop type map, uh, the um, segmentation and classification on the area that you are uh, analyzing. Uh, other than that, uh, you are uh, you have the possibility also of training of training uh, the architecture uh, from scratch. We have several meet, uh, parameters that are uh, exposed that you can uh, tune in order to uh, tune your model. Uh, the network uh, uh, can be trained from scratch using the tension to crop data set, or you can use a new um, data uh, to train the model. And uh, the LSTM ha uh, has also been uh, modified to uh, do uh, the prediction of uh, indexes of indices uh, instead of the classification. So you can use it uh, in order to perform uh, the classification of crop type of, of the classes that you are analyzing, but you can also use it in order to predict uh, several values for the area that you are analyzing. Um, the uh, LSTM uh, can be also trained on uh, different uh, time series. Uh, not uh, uh, it doesn't require to be trained on uh, uh, harmonized time series, but uh, uh, the pre-trained LSTM instead has been trained on twelve monthly composites for a uh, single uh, agronomic year. Um, we are also giving uh, a connected uh, module, module, which is the LSTM inference, uh, and uh, it can be uh, it is uh, uh, adaptable to uh, the uh, different LSTM or uh, architecture that you have trained. This architecture uh, performs the uh, inference on the area that you are analyzing using the mo the model that you have been uh, training. Uh, you can use the pre-trained model, or you can use uh, the model you have developed uh, but uh, obviously the time series that you give as input must be trained uh, uh, must be um, um, uh, must be the same uh, of the one you are using in the inference you can also you have the possibility of, of adding uh, uh, also masks uh, uh, such as a crop mask in order to uh, guide the classification of the um, architecture and uh, perform the classification only on the area on the portion of the image that you are uh, analyzing and uh, uh, the uh, networks that we have been giving uh, are pixel wise classificators so uh, what we are um, actually seeing is a map built upon the uh, classification of single pixels uh, 10 by 10 uh, meter pixels of sentinel 2 uh, images and uh, finally at the end of this uh, uh, step uh, you have the uh, final crop type maps that are stored in a raster in a tiff format and we are also giving the posterior probabilities that are extracted um, as a, um, from the uh, classification of the LSTM and it gives uh, you an indication of the uh, confidence level of uh, uh, the architecture that you have built and of the prediction that you are uh, doing. As for the uh, service of uh, Thales, they uh, are giving, uh, uh, are sharing a deep network for pixel level classification of Sentinel-2 patches. And uh, this particular uh, deep learning uh, model allows uh, the user. Um, so actually uh, the deep network for pixel level classification is a services we provide for uh, agricultural services. So typically what we got is that we got um, images as inputs, which are multispectral images. So typically any Sentinel-2 uh, images and as outputs, we got uh, any label you provide with the data set. So typically it can be crop, sunflower, any kind of crop, it can be land, it can be um, urban or world extraction. So any type of data you provide, we can process it through, through the Docker. So we provide the Docker service uh, which is compatible in any Docker environments. So basically, um, if you can run any Docker, it will it will it will fit. Uh, you also need a GPU that is suitable for uh, deep learning training. So basically, with enough VRAM, but basically we do not provide we do not ask for uh, any uh, big tech uh, systems we can run in any any computer. So uh, next slide, uh, please. So here's an. An example of uh, Sentinel-2 dataset. So it's from the SCN 12 MS dataset. So basically, um, you can have as input here it's RGB images, but we can take multispectral images. Um, and as output, you have a segmented map. So as you see, it's just 
the same image as input, but with um, with the label in the right in the right pixel position. Um, so next slide, please. So here's an example. Once you have trained your model, so as input you will get, as I said, your multispectral images. So for example, uh, it can be a basic image, but instead of having just the RGB, you can have up to 13 uh, image uh, channel as images, for example, for infrared information. Then we have our um, auto-encoder architecture. So as you can see, just an encoder and a decoder, and it will process the data. And as output, we got um, the segment image, so the same size as the input, but instead of having the, the input pixel, you will have the number of uh, class uh, for each pixel. So for example, if you have uh, two classes, you will have zero or one for each pixel, and then you will have your map, and you will have to to get your, your, your data. So uh, next slide, please. So here's a description of the curve. So as I said, we provide a system to train data on continent to images, but we want it more flexible. So typically, not only the train, but we want you to be able to extract the data and pre-process it. We train, of course, and also to make the prediction. And we want it to be able to make it separately. So typically, once you provide the data sets, you can extract the data. Then you can train as many models as you want from the existing data. And once you train the model, you can make as many predictions as you want. So it's, for example, to provide many parameters to uh, a match for your happy with the real training and what's the uh, interesting uh, um the interesting thing about the uh, this uh, kind of uh, service is that it can be uh, subdivided into uh, the three different uh, um, steps. So we can have the patch extraction, the training, and the prediction. Uh, and these modules can be used uh, separately, uh, separately uh, depending on the application uh, that uh, we are um, focusing on. Uh, the user can provide uh, input, input uh, training data or custom training data uh, as, as long as the input remains compatible with the next block and uh, the trained model and uh, the predicted data can be recovered at the end of uh, the classification and used for, for the processing or for the application of the user. Uh, there are several uh, parameters that are um, exposed to the user and uh, all that all the information about this parameter can be found uh, on the technical documentation but just for uh, completeness uh, we have have uh, a slide here with uh, some of the available uh, parameters, which are uh, obviously the path of the different input images and the ground truth that you are going to use if you are not going to use the um, input uh, uh, standard of the service, but you want to uh, personalize it uh, a bit. You can have the path for the output, the model, the process that you want to select. So the different block that you are uh, selecting, uh, the step you want to um, use in your service, you can specify the usage of a pre-trained backbone, or you can train it otherwise from sketch. You have the format of the output and different parameters, cycle parameters that can be used to um, tune the training of the model. Uh, anyway, all the uh, information regarding the parameters is specified on the technical documentation, and you can find uh, everything on the website or ask us uh, directly. So thank you. Uh, that was all from the agriculture side. So uh, thanks, Johan. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mohamed Abdeldadi, and I work at the ACMWF as a scientist for machine learning. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, the health bootstrapping service, uh, which is developed by the ACMWF and the framework of the AI for Performance project. So. Uh, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the service. So the health bootstrapping service helps addressing uh, public health and air pollution challenges using earth observation data. Uh, this service is focused on probabilistic downscaling, uh, which means super resolution of air quality and atmosphere composition. Uh, so since it uses probabilistic models, uh, it allows also to quantify the uncertainties in the downscaled products. So, for instance, the air quality and atmospheric composition uh, variable 
are natively at 80 kilometer uh, spatial resolution and the service allows obtaining uh, these uh, variables at 10 kilometer. So it down scales uh, from 80 kilometers to 10 kilometers. Uh, and indeed this high resolution air quality uh, and, air, and uh, atmospheric composition in real time and forecasts allow uh, policymakers to make informed uh, science informed decisions uh, and concentrate on the observations that we have uh, from these uh, camp services uh, to make uh, different decisions about uh, air pollution, about uh, traffic jams, etc. Uh, so regarding uh, the inputs and the outputs of the service, so we have uh, two phases, as you know. So uh, we have the training phase, uh, and at the training phase, the service takes uh, pairs of low resolution and high resolution air quality or atmospheric compositions. Uh, so the air quality, uh, the low resolution uh, variable will serve as an input uh, for the model and the high resolution will serve as an output. And then the model will try to learn the mapping function between uh, the low resolution and the high resolution. Uh, on the other hand, if, if we are working in the inference phase only, so uh, the input to the model will be the low resolution uh, variable and the model will be responsible uh, to generate uh, the high resolution one uh, using the train model. So, if we look uh, at this slide, we have an example of downscaling uh, of the particulate matter, which is called PM 2.5. Uh, so, PM 2.5 uh, is an air pollutant that is the concern, is a concern for uh, people's health when the level in the air are elevated. Uh, so P PM 2.5 are tiny particles in the air that reduces the visibility and cause uh, the air to appear hazy uh, when the, le the levels are high. So if we look at the figures that we have on the left uh, of the screen, so actually, actually this is the native low resolution uh, that is generated from uh, the global uh, analysis of the camp service at 80 kilometer resolution. And then the figure after that, uh, is the prediction uh, using the uh, bootstrapping service, so using uh, a train model at 10 kilometer resolution. And then the figure after that is actually the final one, which is the ground truth uh, at also 10 kilometer resolution. So if we compare the two models, we have the differences, uh, differences between them and the last figure to the right, uh, which compares the prediction uh, to the ground truth. Uh, so we can see that uh, the service is able to provide uh, realistic uh, outputs for uh, this variable uh, that are comparable to the ground truth uh, that we obtained from the reanalysis service of, uh, of the CAPS. Uh, so finally, how to use this service? So uh, this service actually is uh, incorporate, uh, incorporated inside the Docker container. Uh, so it's, uh, it can be accessed in two different ways. So the first one using the uh, JupyterLab instance, uh, which is also running inside the Docker container. And the second one can, uh, is using the command line tools. So these command line tools allow uh, three different things. First of all, the pre-training of the generator part by itself, or training the whole model, uh, which is the generator and the discriminator, or the inference part uh, only. Uh, so any of these uh, modules can be used separately or in combination with other modules. We also have some modules that allow to uh, download the data from the climate uh, data store, uh, the CDS, uh, using the CDS API. Uh, and uh, we have also pre-processing uh, modules that allow to pre-process the low resolution and high resolution data and prepare them for the training. Uh, so all of these uh, information are available in the technical documentation uh, that's publicly available or via the GitHub uh, repo, which you can uh, use, uh, which you can access uh, on internet and uh, open access for public. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to write me by email or here or in the chat, and uh, I will try to, uh, my best to respond to your questions. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Hello everyone, Richard Hall from, I'm sitting in Stavanger, Norway, uh, and I'm here to give you the 
energy perspective. Uh, my role in Equinor is I'm the specialist in remote sensing. So my job is to guide my 20,000 colleagues in the use of satellite data. And I also have to explain how you cannot use satellite data. Uh, yes, Equinor is a oil and gas company, but we're also the company building the world's biggest offshore wind farm. So we're very much focused on energy. And because I'm an, from an energy company, we always start with safety. And this is also a good introduction because the story, everything you've heard before, from especially from the security perspective of agriculture and from health and the other sectors, they're all relevant. There's a lot of cross uh, crossover between uh, the energy user stories and the security energy stories and the health user stories. So don't, I would, I would say, don't treat them as exclusive, but more as a, they can be very much spread across. But safety, it's about, we want a known situation because it's a safe situation. This allows us to be proactive rather than reactive. From an, our perspective, it satisfies authority and society expectations. And if we know and understand the situation, we make confident decisions to optimize operations. But even as, as individuals, we make better decisions when we have better information and we understand the situation. And with confidence, safe and efficient operations, you increase your reputation, you increase your investor confidence. And what everybody wants, not just Equinor, but every, we want information. Decision makers should focus on the accuracy and quality of the information and not the source of the data. And the example we all use every day is the weather forecast. The weather forecast is produced regardless of the quality of the satellite data as an example. But we're told how the accuracy of the weather forecast. So if, it's a, if they're confident it's not going to rain, we don't need to take an umbrella. If they're not sure if it's going to rain or not, then we can take the risk of getting wet or be more cautious and take that umbrella with us. So energy user stories. And these can be from the EU, national government, city, cities, companies, or just simply individuals. We all want to know where energy installations can be built. Where will be the energy demand? And how can we improve renewable energy production efficiently? To give you one example of how AI for Coper AI technology together with Copernicus data, I use this example from the Alan Turing Institute solar now casting with machine vision because precisely how much solar energy is pumped into the uk's national grid at any one time is not known even by the national grid so they're having projects and they're trying to solve that by using a combination of ai together with open data and short-term forecasting or now casting and that's great because one of our first ai for Copernicus projects slide, I've done exactly that. They've taken MeteorSat data and are now now casting cloud cover over a, a solar farm site. So this is just one very simple demonstration of kind of information we're looking, going from products, cloud cover, to enhanced products, forecasting models. Another source of inspiration is the race dashboard. If you don't know this, the link is in the in the presentation. I can also put it in the chat. But these are all examples of what could be submitted as, as um, demonstrations for this fifth call. Using the products that have been de de described or your own or own methodologies that you've that you've developed. So going into a bit more detail, it's like, as a user, I want to know where I can and cannot build low carbon and renewable energy infrastructure. For example, how many and where solar and wind farms can be built in Europe?
as a user, I want a better understanding of energy consumption, energy needs of a society. How much energy does a settlement use? But connecting those two is not only how much, how much, how many solar panels are in a settlement. How much direct, how much distributed energy can they consume that is available to them? So how much network energy do they need to continue that to support their society? And then there's the application of improving um, maintenance. For example, again with solar farms, dust storms. Does a dust storm affect the whole area of a solar farm, or does it is it just one corner? Which solar panels do I clean first? Can I be, can I be, be more precise? And just to go through the data, it's all the meteorological data from uh, from from CAMS, from the Copernicus Atmospheric Services, as presented by ECNWF. I use the example of eModnet, which is where offshore, which has, for example, offshore wind farms are located. It can be used as training data for detecting wind farms. There's a lot of other data there. Then there's the JRC Open Power Plants database, which contains all, I think it's, it's a very comprehensive data set and all the energy infrastructure within Europe. And then also we have the open data from a floating offshore wind farm as an example. But you can suggest other data, data sets to be made available. We can connect other data sets. We can see who can make them available. So if you have any questions, please do ask. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Jacek Tukarski from Cloud Ferro from Warsaw. Uh, you can hear me well and see my screen. Yes, yes. yes. Great. <laughs> So we can start. In this, in this presentation, we will focus on the overview end of uh, resources we provide as a part of uh, AI for C uh, Copernicus project as the operator of the Quio Diaz and uh, Vicio uh, platform. Thank you uh, to that we uh, have joined two eminent companies. And so let's start to the, uh, pro to the talk about the project resources. Uh, maybe uh, not everyone knows that, uh, but, but we represent uh, DIAS uh, Data and Information Access Services, Queer DIAS and Vicio are such. Uh, DIAS, it belong to the DIAS family, uh, which are the access point to all data available as a part of the Copernicus project and resources related to all Sentinels. In addition, we provide IS and the PASS services uh, that uh, are a part of the production products uh, we offer. Uh, I encourage to, you, you to visit uh, the presented links in the screen and um, like creodias.eu uh, and vikio.eu, where you can find additional information about uh, our services. I present what is a typical data set available uh, on the creodias portal. As you can see, we have uh, data sets related to Sentinel 1A, 2A, or 3 uh, a products uh, in the products column, as you see in the left uh, side column, you will find data that may may be uh, of interest to you in terms of the use of a given product. Uh, detailed descriptions uh, can be found on our uh, website. Availability, uh, the uh, archive is described in the last column, whatever it is uh, available or uh, requires an additional order. Um, in case of doubts uh, about the availability of the data set, please contact me or uh, our um, data, data science uh, or EO uh, data teams uh, that maintains uh, this uh, uh, repository. We will agree uh, whatever uh, we can obtain it or make it available.
you can see a similar description of the products, but uh, within the Vikio uh, projects, the whole project is available uh, at the link vikio.eu. Uh, and uh, in data set section, you will find this uh, description of individual uh, available uh, data sets. I would like to offer you access to the part of the AI for a Copernicus project dedicated access to our cloud from which you will uh, be able to access Sentinel data via a S3 interface where you can create your own Kubernetes uh, clusters and your own virtual environments uh, based on the resources available uh, based on the resources of a given cloud. When would you like to use our resources uh, to use it in a project when you can uh, prepare with uh, technical support or uh, know how to, um, to monitor? In addition, you also have access to uh, the Docker registry in the, uh, in the form uh, of the uh, Go Harbor application. Uh, which allow access to images pr produced by work package number four, but more about it, what uh, bootstrapping services and, uh, and Docker uh, Omer set uh, in our presentation. How to um, achieve uh, Creodia's uh, resources in AI for a Copernicus uh, project, how to log in uh, to, um, to, to, to this platform. So I think this, it's, it's the short, uh, short way, short algorithm to uh, following user step. The first important is uh, please create an account on a, a new.cloudferro.com. Uh, and start to uh, register uh, in a Cloudfarer contact point. And the rest of information you can find in our uh, FAQ uh, in Creodias uh, AU uh, slash FAQ or contact uh, our, uh, our support. Similar situation is in a similar way, but with a different, uh, different, different links, uh, how to achieve uh, access to Vikio uh, resources. You, at the first step, uh, create account uh, in a Vikio elasticity.cloudferro.com slash login. And then you will have access to Vikio Elastic Cloud and you register, uh, contact our, our services, support, and register, and you can find the flavors on a, a, our a public a clouds, vikio, uh, dot docs, cloud, dot com. Uh, the rest uh, links to the FAQ or technical uh, support you can find in, uh, in this presentation and in this link. Thank you very much. Omar, please. Yes, thank you, Jacek. I would like to be to try to be very quick because I think I would have some delay. I wanted just to show you, I'm going to share my screen, a couple of things in order it could be also useful. So uh, first of all, this is the Harbor registry, that uh, the Docker registry that we have. So basically, as uh, we have already commented, yes? Yeah, sorry, we didn't see your screen before, so now it's ah, okay. Okay, sorry. This is the, the Docker registry. So basically, as we said, the, all the services are available as Docker images that we can find here, for example, for the security services. We see that we have different versions because we have made some updates and so on. So basically, uh, if you are a funded project, finally, you will be able to have access to this and you will be able to access to this uh, Docker image like this. And then for exploiting this, you can directly pull these images 
from the Docker registry, for example, like this. I have already it, so it is quite fast in my site. But uh, then what you can do is or run this locally in order to run your, your examples. For example, I can run Docker with my this security services where I can mount a volume in order to have access to have communication or to have uh, the output finally persistent in my PC. Or it is also possible to use Credodia's services in order to deploy a, a pod or to or in their way the, this Docker registry, this uh, Docker image. So for example, let me show you because I had already some examples where I can see I'm going to connect to the Kubernetes cluster of Creodias as for the for the project. And I have already a pod with the security services. So if we go to this, so I'm running this Docker image inside Creodias. And the main advantage of this is that, for example, as already just said, we have full access to the EO archive. So for example, I can see that we have all this information. And if I go, for example, to check uh, from Sentinel to the level 2A product that we have on the uh, 23rd of March of 2021, we see that all the products are available there. And you can have access directly there. So you, for example, you could run a command like this to copy them locally to the to a folder in your uh, uh, in your virtual machine or in your pod. So you can then launch the process like this. And also, this is a, the main advantage of being in Creodias is that you have the data there. You don't have to worry about uh, downloading the data from Sci-Hub or from whatever. And then also in this pod, as this is the security services, uh, sorry, we have also the pipelines for the security services. So for example, we can check that we have, as I said, it is possible to access to the source code of some of these processing, like for example, the Sentinel and JDP process, Sentinel to preprocess and so on. So you can adapt it by yourself if you want, or you can ask us for support if needed. And we could, for example, run a command like this in order to make the processing. So if you see in the command I have put that I'm going to launch the Sentinel one JD processing. I'm putting the the parameters that I need. And for the input, I'm indicating the input that I have recovered directly from the S3 storage that I have mounted in my in my pod. So I have a very quick access to the data. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Omar, for your demo and uh, Jancek for the presentation of the cloud resources. Uh, 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 the cloud resources will be available to all uh, winners of, the, um, of this open call. <coughs> and uh, I'm going to give the floor to Despina uh, Athanasia Padazi from UOA, University of Athens, and she, talk, she will talk about uh, the semantic services and the FQA engine. Despina, uh, the floor is Yes, yours. hi, thank you, Adoni. Thank you very much. So hopefully you can see my screen my screen now. So hello yes. everyone. I'm Despina Badazi, and today with my colleague Elena Chalapati, uh, we will present uh, the linked data tools that are available in AI for Copernicus and the QA engine. And we are from uh, National and Capodistrian University of Athens. So why linked data? Um, there is a goal there is a vision for the use of linked data. And this is to go from a web of documents to a web of data. In order, and in order to achieve this, we need to unlock open data dormant in their silos. We need, we need to make this, available, this data available uh, on the web using uh, semantic web technologies such as RDF, Sparkle, URIs, and HTTP. And in order to make it more uh, useful, we need to interlink it with other uh, interesting data. For example, data uh, that is stored in European data portals. And how can we use uh, linked data? We need to have a language. And this language is Sparkle and GeoSparkle. 
First of all, Sparkle is the standard query language for RDF and uh, three, uh, W3C, uh, which is a worldwide uh, web uh, consortium recommendation. And then we have from the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, Geosparkle, which is a standard for representing and querying geospatial linked data. So we have the addition of uh, geospatial information in Geosparkle. So to be more, more specific, let's see an example. In the left side, you can see a query that we have in natural language, which is find all potato fields in Kitsburg area that are less than two kilometers away from Elbe River. So as you can see with different colors, we have uh, different properties in this query. In the left, uh, in the right side, you can see how we can exp express this natural language uh, query in GeoSparkle. And as you can see here, I will explain um, each section, which is for a different property and how we can retrieve um, the requested uh, data. So we need to select distinct fields because we need to find potato fields where a field has a specific label name, which is a potato because we need potato fields. And this field has specific geometry, which is represented as WKT with a specific uh, value. So we retrieve this value, first of all. Then regarding the area, we need Kitsburg area. So we need to use uh, the data set, a uh, global administrative uh, divisions, which is GADM as a shortcut. So we need a, a level three administrative unit, which has as a name Kitsburg. Has specific, it has a specific geometry and we get uh, this value as WKT. So we retrieve this uh, value as well. We need to filter now these two values so that um, the area, uh, the administrative area uh, contains the field. And we do this using this um, row here with this filter. And then last but not least, we need to take into account uh, the distance and the river. So we, we use one more data set. Um, we get a river which has a name Elbe, which, has, uh, which is a node, has a node river part. And we get this geometry here as well. And then we apply one more filter in order to have a specific distance where the field we, which uh, was retrieved here and the river um, have a distance less than 2000 meters. So if we have this query and we execute it, we will get the fields that are uh, requested uh, using this uh, query. So uh, if you have many more data sets, we just need to uh, transform this uh, data into RDF, uh, which is the format of linked data in order to make it useful and uh, interlink with other data. But let's be a bit more specific here. Uh, in AI for Copernicus, we make available five different linked data tools, which are GeoTriples, uh, Strabon, Jedi, Semagro, and Sextant. And let's take a look a bit in the pipeline that these five tools create. First of all, we start with uh, our available data, which uh, is transformed into RDF uh, using the tool GeoTriples and they can also be interlinked with other data using the tool Jedi Spatial. Then uh, these two uh, tools uh, provide uh, data in RDF and this RDF uh, data can be stored in Strabon. Then we have endpoints in Strabon which can be federated with other external endpoint, uh, endpoints, uh, Sparkle or GeoSparkle endpoints using the tools the tool Semagro. And last but not least, we can visualize this data using the tool uh, Sextant. And to be a bit more specific here, let's take, uh, let's say a few things about each one of these tools. First of all, regarding GeoTriples, uh, we can use them, we can use it in order to transform the data into the RDA format, the linked data format. And in order to do this, we need to utilize an ontology. So as you can see here, we get as an input a shape file in this example, but there are many other available formats that can be used as inputs. 
um, we give an ontology and then we produce the RDF uh, data. And if the right side, you can see an example of the mapping file that is created as a first step uh, using uh, the tool GeoTriples. And then this mapping file uh, is used in order to create the, the RDF uh, output. So for example, here, uh, we needed to transform a shape file uh, which included precipitation information about uh, the river Duro. So um, the ontology included information such as um, the name of the class, which, which was food security observation, and uh, some properties were, well, which was uh, the start date, which was the end date, and um, much more information. Of course, we can uh, help you and provide support uh, for the use of all these uh, tools. The second tool is the type spatial, which uh, detects spatial links between data sets. And it is very useful because it lowers very much uh, the query execution times for queries that uh, use uh, the produced links, uh, the links that are output um, of the Jedi spatial uh, tool. So for example, here you can see that we give us an input to shape files, we use the tool and then we get these links. And uh, to be a bit more specific, let's say that we had uh, two different geometries, the, the, the geometry of object one and the geometry of object two. And as we can see here, they intersect and uh, we have one more area, this red pink area, let's say. So if we didn't have uh, the links that are produced uh, using the Jedi spatial, we would have we would have to compute each time a very expensive um, uh, thing, which is the filter uh, which in, which uh, finds these intersections. So we had to do this each time. But if we use the Jedi spatial, we will have uh, this link, and uh, we will not need to do this uh, um, very expensive execution. Then we have Strabon and Semagro. Uh, Strabon is used to store the RDF uh, data that we produced using GeoTriples and Jedi uh, Spatial. And we, we can use uh, also Semagro in order to federate uh, the endpoint uh, that is produced uh, with Strabon or many endpoints with external uh, Sparkle or GeoSparkle endpoints. And as you can see here, this is the GeoSparkle query that we, we've seen in the previous slides. So if we put this in a Strabon endpoint, we will get uh, the information that we want. Sorry. Last but not least, we can visualize um, the results uh, of the, all these queries using the tool Sextant. So as you can see here, we have many different layers and each one of these layers is produced uh, by a GeoSparkle or Sparkle query. So, um, each one of these produce a different, uh, a different color in this map. So if we have uh, different geometries that we need to retrieve from a query, uh, all these geometries can be seen in this map. Uh, so this is a very brief uh, presentation of these tools. May much more information is provided in the technical documentation. And of course, if you have any more questions, please uh, let us know so that we can help you transform your data and you and make it more uh, valuable. And uh, now I give the floor to Eleni. So thank you very much, Despina. Uh, now, um, up to now, Despina showed you how we can transform our data in a leak data form, in an RDF form, so to be able to access them, um, let's say, efficiently. Uh, um, and, and also showed you two languages, two formal languages, uh, Sparkle and GeoSparkle, uh, through which you can access your data, uh, GeoSparkle for the geospatial part of your data. Um, the thing is that uh, we do understand uh, this is that this is not really accessible, it's not really an approachable way to uh, uh, access your data if you're not really uh, a data expert uh, or you're not familiar with like, data technology. So our vision was to is um, to change this so to allow uh, end users to access the data using just natural language. Uh, so to make uh, questions in natural language, as we do in Google. 
Um, so, uh, in the previous example that uh, Lesbina showed you, instead of having uh, this uh, formal uh, way of typing a query that is on, 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 on the right of the slide, to have just uh, the question on the left and to have a machine that will be able to translate this question automatically to a query. Um, so uh, what Google can do up to now? So Google up to now uh, can answer geospatial uh, knowledge uh, questions up to a point. So if you, for instance, uh, question, uh, put the question to Google, uh, which countries border Greece? Uh, you will see that uh, it will automatically uh, generate some answers, like here. Uh, it does this this way, in, in two different ways. Uh, either it has a knowledge graph and retrieves this uh, information from a knowledge graph, which is not the case here, or automatically can find the relevant text on the web and show the answers, uh, very precisely, let's say. But there are cases that Google cannot do that. For instance, if we ask other type of questions, very simple ones, like which Greek cities contain lakes, um, again, uh, um, Google would try to find the text that has this information, but for instance, if you see here, it fails. It has a website that has several lakes, but it's not, uh, it doesn't reply our answer. We have to find for our answer. Uh, um, this is also the case uh, in the data sets of, of uh, Google. So if we want to uh, make a question, an observation question type of question, like give all Sentinel-2 satellite images that show uh, Mount Etna and have been taken in February 2021, it will not be able to understand the question and retrieve uh, the answer. Uh, what even so, so uh, thinking also the fact that you could not answer the questions which uh, cities have lakes in Greece, if you ask, an earth observation question like give more signal to question, uh, uh, to data that uh, have water bodies, for instance, in cities, it will not be able to get the answers because it doesn't even answer the geospatial part of the question. Uh, so what we have done is that we have created the Earth QA tool, system, yeah, tool uh, that accepts as an input questions in natural language, earth observation related questions in a natural language uh, that ask for specific data sets that may have several properties and we will see later what kind of properties we now support. Uh, and um, it can, okay, they can also have this question a geospatial part uh, and also a temporal part. Uh, and what it does is it takes us input this question and translate it automatically to a GeoSparkle or Sparkle query. And then this query is executed over a, a, a knowledge graph. And we automatically get the answers. So some questions are like this. Find certain L1 products that show Edna in March 2018. So as you can see, we have this, the, the type of the uh, Edna observation product that we're looking for some geospatial component, where in this case is uh, Mount Edna, and uh, the temporal component, which is the uh, March 2018. Or you can be a bit more complex, like say, which instruments have been used, like Sentinel-2 MCI projects, uh, or what's the cloud coverage or the snow coverage uh, that you're looking for. And also, again, to have a temporal property and other, again, uh, properties that are related to the uh, Earth observation product. Um, so what is a knowledge graph? So as we said, FQA, uh, as uh, Desmond also said, what we have here is that we uh, our data are in a lake data form, which practically means that uh, they are in the form of a knowledge graph, which is a, a term that we hear uh, more often, let's say. Uh, a knowledge graph, is a directed graph that, that is consisted of entities, uh, the data, and binary relations between these entities. Um, so for FQA, we have used uh, a knowledge graph that encodes metadata of first observation product from the Creodias archive. And also we have used the uh, knowledge graph from DPPDA which is a well-known uh, 
knowledge graph that is widely used uh, for the geospatial uh, entities. Um, okay, now uh, the upper level, let's say, of this knowledge graph uh, has these two basic nodes, which is the feature and the hexagon. Basically, the feature uh, represents the observation products. And uh, this feature, the, let's say, the properties. Uh, um, of these features are the instruments, the platform, the geometry, the mission, the product type. So why I show you this? Because I, I want to show you that uh, the equations that you can make uh, can be related to all these properties. So you can ask for a product in a specific mission or that has, is from a specific platform using some specific instrument and so on. And also we have the hexagon that uh, represent lakes, mountains, cities, and so on from uh, the Pipedia. There are also other properties that we can support because uh, the Creodias archive supports, um, like the polarization, the resolution, the orbit direction. So again, your question can be something like, give me all entity, all uh, sorry, Sentinel-2 products that have resolution more than this. Uh, or that um, the processing uh, started at that date, and so on. Um, okay, now this is how, this is the pipeline, let's say, of uh, FQA. I'm not going to go into much details about that. I'm just uh, an overview, a quick overview of that is that uh, you basically have your question, FQA decomposes this question, uh, understands the syntax of the question and decomposes to several components, and this is automatically uh, translated to uh, a Spark query, which is uh, executed over a Strabo, the North observation data endpoint. And this is how we get the answers at the end. Uh, so this is an example of uh, this translation. So suppose that we have the qu question, find certain L1 products that saw Edna uh, in March 2018. Uh, and what uh, the uh, FQA does, it uh, transform it, transforms it to the Spark query, to this Spark query that returns the title of the product and the geometry. It requires that the uh, geometry of the product will be on uh, Mount Netna. Um, and also that uh, the mission of the, that describes this product is Sentinel-1 and the date, uh, our, the date is uh, on the third month of 2018, I mean, March of 2018, and returns the first 1,000 answers. And this is just the threshold, so it will keep, I mean, we can define this uh, based on the question. Uh, and this is the demo, how FQA looks like. Uh, so, for instance, here we have the question of find, find 73A WFR products that cover Corsica uh, with data collected in January 18, 2018. Sorry. And uh, this is how, what it will retrieve. So, FQA also cooperates with Sexta in order to uh, give also the visual, um, a visual representation of the answer. And of course, the products themselves, uh, links, uh, URLs of the products themselves. So uh, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know and uh, we will reply. Uh, thank you very much, Eleni, for, uh, for these uh, services. And now I will want to, to give the floor to Martin Wells from Frankhofen, which present a tool that is not of the AI for Copernicus uh, Consortium, but it, it is also an, an important tool in the AI on demand ecosystem, namely the AI for experiments, uh, uh, AI for experiments platform. So, Martin, thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours. So, um, my name is Martin Wells. I work for Fraunhofer in Germany, and uh, I'm the lead architect of AI for experiments. And why might you be interested in this tool? Because it gives you a possibility to um, publish your tools and automatically deploy them to uh, the Creo Diaz platform and execute it there. So basically, uh, the first part of AI for Experiments is a catalog. It is a catalog of reusable AI tools. So each 
uh, of uh, uh, the, the small boxes here represents an AI tool, and they should be reusable in the sense that they can be combined together in different ways. In different ways to create pipelines, AI pipelines. So for example, um, in, in the above image, uh, you see um, in, um, an audio pipeline, which uh, has a file broker um, segmentation and then processing of the uh, speech data. And the data is collected in a, a dialogue creator. And uh, in, the, in, in the lower image, you see that uh, one tool has been added for topic extraction to this pipeline, and this can be done very easily. So it is also targeted at non-AI expert users to create usable pipelines uh, for their purposes. To actually publish uh, a tool there, um, it takes two steps. So the first step is onboarding. Uh, and it, it consists of the model name and then the Docker container. And the, the words uh, below the images are actually links. So they are video tutorials uh, that show you step-by-step step how to onboard and how to publish a model. So this is important. Those two um, are links here below that you can navigate to and see how it goes. So the architecture of AI for experiments uh, is separated in the one part, which is the model catalog, the visual composition and collaboration part. And then cleanly and clearly separated is the execution part, the execution environments, uh, which are separate systems like Creo Diaz and Vikio. And currently under development is uh, an automatic deployer to deploy pipelines and models to uh, the CreoDS uh, environment automatically with one click. So for all that uh, to be possible, there needs to be some specification on how the tools should be packaged and we rely on, uh, I would say, a state of the art technologies so it should be a Docker container uh, and um, it should have the protobuf definition of the public interface. So you see it on the right-hand side, there is um, the definition of a public interface for the classic example of an iris classifier. And this makes it possible to actually connect the tools together. So this is, uh, used by the Visual Studio by uh, to, to uh, compose the pipelines, but also by the orchestrator, which uh, in the end executes the pipeline. They all rely on uh, this uh, portable format for protocol definitions. So we rely also on GRPC communication. There can be a web UI integrated in this container, uh, for user interaction to make some configurations or to view results, for example. Everything is based on uh, free and open source technologies. Uh, and we have some recommendations for scalability, training, and GPU support. And we also support gRPC streaming for event-based pipelines. So here are some best practices um, to um, build your Docker image that it can work with or without GPU. It might be important for uh, image processing, uh, especially satellite images. And we also have a shared folder concept to exchange data among the nodes of a pipeline. I will come later to that. So important is to say that if you package your tool into um, a container for AI for experiments, it is not a lock-in, so it will stay uh, a standard Docker container just with additional properties. So you can run it everywhere uh, a Docker container runs. So this is uh, important. The access to data is done normally by data brokers or via data brokers, which is a node of the pipeline. And the data broker is a small and a shallow tool 
to access the data. So it does not contain the data set, especially for satellite images, it wouldn't make sense. It only knows how to access it. So this is uh, a component that you can use to configure or to select the satellite images that you want to process in the pipeline. Uh, and it might have also or contains the credentials that are needed and um, the, the IP addresses of, of uh, the storage for the images. Regarding intellectual property, so it AF experiments supports open source models as well as commercial contents, commercial models, and each published tool must have a license. It can be open source or commercial, proprietary, um, that's all fine. And also regarding this AI for experiments, it intentionally does not store any Docker images or any data sets. It only stores the metadata. So we store links uh, to Docker images into a registry, can be public registry or uh, a private registry. And we also store links to data sets, or as I said, uh, this information is contained in a data broker in a component that is used to bring the data into the pipeline nodes. Then we have also the concept of a shared folder, which gives access to a common storage for all pipeline nodes. Um, so here's an example of a training pipeline uh, they all have access to the shared folder under the path of data shared and the news trainer and uh, the classifier and the tensor board node they all have access to this common folder and this folder is basically uh, the head of a whole file system so you can create subfolders and create your own uh, structure there so it's not limited to just one level of data storage then finally, we also have um, an advanced orchestrator that is part of um, a deployment into an execution environment. So the orchestrator takes the topology of uh, a pipeline and then dispatches the messages according to the topology um, along the edges. So it would uh, send messages, takes uh, the output of this uh, first node and uh, send it to the second node uh, and uh, take the output of the second node and send it to uh, the input of the third node. And it also supports, uh, supports certain cyclic topologies. And the orchestrator really can, uh, leveraging uh, gRPC and protobuf properties, it can interact with models it has never seen before. And this is a feature that no other platform uh, offers at this point in time. So here are finally the links uh, for the platform itself, uh, for the container specification. Uh, we have source code tutorial, uh, tutorials and also uh, a YouTube playlist with many tutorials uh, for certain topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for being with us and presenting the i for Copernicus platform, uh, i for experiment, sorry, platform. My pleasure. Um, uh, now the next, uh, the final, uh, the final session of today, is uh, is by so by Sotiris Pelekis uh, from the i Energy project. Now the um, uh, as you probably already know, I, the i for Copernicus project is. Uh, actually belongs to the family of uh, six uh, projects with uh, more or less the same function of uh, adding um, new new services to the AI on demand platform. And uh, one of the other ST49 projects is the AI, AI Energy project. Um, and uh, in order to, to help uh, the, the, the proposals uh, to, to have uh, to test more services in the AI on the AI, AI on demand ecosystem, we decided to add also um, the um, services from uh, some supplementary services from the AI Energy project. So these services will be presented by Sotiris, 
and uh, thank you uh, for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Um, great, my name is Sotiris Berlekis. I work as a researcher at the National Technical University of Athens and the Institute of Communication and Computer Systems, or ICCS. Um, regarding the purpose of this uh, presentation, my point is to briefly introduce you to our project and then give an overview of uh, ICCS is basically contributions on behalf of final project as uh, there's no time to get through all uh, our contributions as a project. I am also happy to say that, uh, yeah, that my presentation is after Martin's uh, because we also include a short demo of an AI, AI for experiments pipeline that we have created uh, with our team. Um, so the energy project is part of the ICT49 cluster and is coordinated by ICCS. Its main purpose is to develop AI services for uh, next generation energy. Um, regarding the composition of uh, the consortium, uh, we concentrate 17 partners from uh, nine countries, including seven leading research and academy institutions. Um, alongside the nine electrical power and energy system stakeholders that pretty much cover the full energy value chain. <clears throat> With respect to our vision as an ICT project, we aim to deliver an energy-specific open modular framework for supporting AI on demand, uh, focusing on the energy sector, and uh, that will serve multiple electrical power and energy system subdomains. Uh, so in the pursuit of this vision, the project's outcomes are applied and validated in nine real-life pilots spreading across eight countries and experimenting with uh, 15 different use cases. And a brief overview of these use cases is shown here. ICCS contributes actively in uh, five of them, with mainly short term load forecasting oriented services, amongst others. And now, briefly proceeding with ICCS's main contributions to AI for experiments, uh, we have developed uh, mainly short term load forecasting uh, models for transmission system operators, including light GBM, uh, N bits, and long short term memory networks. Uh, alongside an electricity demand prediction model tailored for a domestic heating network owned by Veolia in Spain. Um, these models are uh, regarding the inference part. So they mainly provide uh, inference and predictions. Uh, to reinforce uh, these uh, capabilities, we also developed a data broker that uh, um, allows to um, uh, input CSV files as um, I input and associate input historical data to the models. Uh, all of these uh, contributions um, include helpful documentation, and we also have uh, developed a dedicated GitHub repository with code that and uh, documentation in the, in the link that I provide here. And regarding the inference models, uh, they also include some client scripts that help the user to. Uh, to understand how they they should call them they sh and they should uh, uh, get their predictions, basically. Um, in the following slide, we proceed with a brief presentation of uh, the technical as aspects of uh, the uploaded uh, MBITS based uh, inference model. I won't get through the rest of the forecasting models as they exhibit similar characteristics. Uh, yeah, so the main things I would like to say here is that uh, we have done uh, uh, we have conducted uh, significant research on this model. Um, we achieved the MAP uh, main absolute percent at zero of uh, 2.37% on 2021 data. And um, um, this model mainly refers to the electricity load of Portugal. Um, this uh, should be noted, but it could be easily extended to other countries as well. And we are also preparing some uh, assets in this direction. Uh, the lookback window is 10 days, which means 10 times 24 time steps uh, as input, which means that the CSV file to be provided should have uh, all of these time steps to, for the model to work and provide predictions. And regarding the technical, uh, the, the arguments, the parameters, let's say that the, um, the application will need to the, the, can change can uh, they can be changed by the user are the forecast horizon the roll size and the batch size of the predictions. Um, regarding the more uh, research part, uh, we can see the reasons uh, for highlighting the NBITS architecture here. This uh, architecture has been extensively used within our experiments in energy, 
and has been benchmarked against others, including temporal convolutional networks and LSTMs. The results have shown that it is consistently more accurate, computationally efficient, and robust than the others. And actually, we recently published a research study that um, tweaks those aspects as a preprint to archive. The link is also provided for those of you that may be interested. Uh, as previously mentioned, the load forecasting data broker is another important contribution to AI for experiments. And the data broker allows the user to upload their CSV through user interface. Um, then uh, communicates these um, these inputs to the gRPC protocol to uh, to the forecasting model, and uh, we have automatic inference um, uh, according to the user requirements. Uh, I would like to also to mention that uh, this data broker is compatible with uh, most of the, the aforementioned forecasting models like LGBM and LSTM and that it is also extendable to other time series forecasting tasks uh, apart from uh, short-term load forecasting, which is uh, the main use case. Uh, so here uh, is um, the, the video that I mentioned. We can see that uh, we first get the forecasting model, which is like GBM here. Then we link it with the data broker, as Martin mentioned previously. We save it, validate it on the platform, and then download it uh, as a Kubernetes uh, deployment file. And yeah, we follow the documentation, the steps provided by the documentation to create the namespace and then uh, just follow the documentation steps to provide this uh, automatic deployment. We also visit the, the front end for uh, the data broker where we can upload our CSV with the historical time series that will be given to the model to provide predictions. And after, uh, then after um, running the, um, the orchestrator, and uh, here we monitor the, both of the containers of uh, the data broker here, and the light GBM model below, so that we can see the inputs and uh, outputs respectively. And yeah, after uh, activating the orchestrator, we will see that we get, uh, yeah, here are the, are the inputs, and below we can see the outputs of the model. Um, yeah, pretty much this is uh, the, um, the demo. Uh, this is it from my side. Basically, before closing, I would like to mention that the full list of energy assets can be found uh, at the AI and Demand Asset Repository. These assets have been developed by the project consortium alongside the open call participants and include a wide range of uh, contributions and uh, service types. And of course, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sotiri, for your presentation, for the tools and for the demo that we have, you have uh, you had um, presented here. Um, we were planning originally to have um, um, a last Q&A session, but unfortunately, uh, the time has passed, so this is not possible. However, every question that you have already posted uh, in the chat or um, any, any, any other question that you want to send us uh, offline through email will, will be answered. And then um, they, we will uh, create this, uh, we will update the frequent asked questions uh, documentation with uh, all, those, all those questions. So with all that said, Thank you very much for your uh, for, for attending all here, and um, uh, I will remind you that the deadline was for the proposals will be 31st of, of March. Uh, good luck with your proposal, proposals, and thank you all for uh, being here with us.